Is interoperability just a buzzword in the blockchain world or the key to unlocking its true potential? Despite tremendous growth, blockchains remain fragmented with many operating in isolation. Interoperability is crucial for bridging these divides, ensuring a unified crypto economy. But is this really achievable? And if yes, how? In this episode, we are joined by Robinson Berkey, co-founder of Wormhole Foundation, to discuss Wormhole's ambitions to connect all chains. Robinson takes us back three years ago to the founding story of Wormhole. We also discuss Wormhole's upcoming token launch and the role W will play in the Wormhole ecosystem. And finally, we discuss how Wormhole thinks in decades, not years, and their end game to become a fully decentralized public good. GMGM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. We make sense of an on-chain world in constant transformation. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that interoperability is going to change the world. That's why I'm carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. GM Robinson, welcome to Web3 Academy. GM, GM, thank you for uh, having me on. I'm excited to be here and chat today. Awesome. We are super excited to have you. We've been talking lots about Wormhole over the past, I would say over over the past year, but really more recently, won't deny that we've been talking about uh, your points program and the airdrop that's upcoming. And there's a lot of excitement in our community around that. We're not going to start there, though. I want to go back to the purpose. You've embarked on a very large mission here, you know, to empower blockchain on-chain builders to create interoperability technologies, which is not easy to do. So kudos to you. Can you sort of take us back to the beginning, walk us through maybe a bit of your backstory and what led you to found Wormhole Foundation? And then maybe we'll lead into the purpose and the mission of Wormhole Foundation. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as a person, as an individual, I've been building, I guess, within the startup space for the better part of a decade. It was more obviously in the Web2 space when I first started my career. Was it AI before it was cool? I think I like to say. Was it a healthcare tech startup that was acquired? Then was it DoorDash? For those of you who are familiar, I think most are now. Third party delivery service was there on the new verticals team for about four years. I had always had this interest in crypto back in 2017. Personally, I got interested. Someone I knew started mining Ethereum back when that was a thing. And I was like, what are you doing with this very hot and loud or system? It looked like to me at the time before I more understood it more. So that was kind of like my dipping my toe in the water, if you will. So got interested there. And then at the time I was at DoorDash, I was doing well. But once the IPO happened and we went public, I was like, all right, what's the next challenge? And I wanted to get more serious when I came to Web3 and crypto. I actually started my Web3 career in the Polkadot ecosystem. For those of you who aren't familiar, Polkadot was started by Gavin Wood. Gavin Wood worked closely with Talit, you know, the founder of Ethereum, if you will. Gavin Wood helped code the EVM itself. A story as it goes, as you might hear, is that Gavin was like, you know, Ethereum won't scale and spun out and uh, created Polkadot. And Polkadot essentially is what I would call like an app chain network. Right. It's what kind of Ethereum is now with all the L2s, right? But it's been live for, you know, many, many years now. So I was always interested in this concept of interoperability. So I was originally drawn to Polkadot, helped launch a chain there called the Kala. It was actually the first parachain, which is just their branded term for app chain, if you will. And then I ended up, once we launched the chain, I looked around and I was like, who is kind of doing really big things in the industry? Who's building that, you know, the next most important infrastructure beyond blockchains, right? We have the apps, things like that, but who's building that that critical infrastructure, if you will? And Jump Crypto at the time was doing a lot of that. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Jump is a, a really you know traditional trading firm in the space that they also have a, a crypto arm. And they, I ended up joining the team, really kind of like incubating a wormhole there. And eventually we spun it out of Jump. So now it's across like five, six different entities and growing almost by the month in terms of contributors. And the Wormhole Foundation that I helped co-found is kind of in charge of coordinating across all these bodies and making sure Wormhole and interoperability in general continues to grow. Amazing. So let's jump into Jump. Can't help but use that word there. Uh, Let's jump into Wormhole for a second here. 
for those who maybe not be so familiar with Wormhole, or even for those who are, I think there's just so many projects in the space. It's so difficult to keep on top of all of them. Give us a sort of a, a background on when you were at Jump and you first were incubating Wormhole. Why did you come up with the idea? What was the problem that you saw in the blockchain space that you wanted to solve? Yeah, so definitely I can't I can't take credit for coming up with the idea of Wormhole. We had a core core group of of engineers who originally actually kind of came up with the idea of connecting Solana and Ethereum at, at the asset level. I'll get into kind of how we think about levels. But I think the thesis at the time was interoperability is extremely important if crypto ever wants to work or become mainstream. And I'll explain why. You'll probably hear on this segment like me talk about this term interoperability. It's like a long word, uh, but really it just means two systems operating with one another, right? Like working together. It's nothing new. So when we think about the banking systems, right? Banking systems are these like closed systems and they need a way to communicate with one another. Like if I wire money to someone who has a different bank, you know, how, how does that happen? It happens via, via communication network. That network is called SWIFT. SWIFT helps these banks interoperate. Cloud compute needs a way for their servers to interoperate. We're taking this like high level concept and applying it to blockchains. Blockchains, a lot of people will simplify them almost as like databases and ledgers, you know, with these virtual machines you can put on top and then build applications, right? But they don't talk to each other. Solana and Ethereum are kind of these closed environments. They don't know what goes on on the other one. They have no knowledge of this. And so Wormhole, it's orig- like the original idea was, hey, Solana is gaining a lot of traction. Ethereum you know, has a good amount of traction. How do we connect these two? Like you, at the time, you could not send, you could not send assets between the two, mm-hmm. right? And so that was kind of the original impetus of, well, the problem we're solving here is like, if I want to send my money or my tokens on Ethereum to Solana, how do I do that? That was kind of the original like, problem to be solved fast forward today or across 30 plus blockchains you know tons of different applications are now built on top of wormhole but i think it's important to kind of like at least go back frame the idea frame interoperability from not just a crypto perspective and yeah that's kind of the how things were started. before we dive in further just to give some context here because as you said there was a group of people that initially came up for the idea for wormhole and now we have Wormful Foundation, which you are one of the co-founders of. Can you sort of give us a, a map or an explanation of how Wormhole and Wormhole Foundation work together so we everybody has clarity on that throughout the episode? Absolutely. So it, within, within I think, the crypto space, Web3 space in general, you'll see this very like uh, common model. So Wormhole, I would think about it similarly to like Ethereum. Ethereum is a protocol. There's no one that actually works for Ethereum. And that's by design. So for Wormhole, there's no one that works for Wormhole. There are teams that contribute to the open source code that Wormhole is. Not a lot of projects are open source, by the way. Well, not a lot of interoperability protocols. But the Wormhole Foundation is just one of, you know, technically anyone could come along and contribute to Wormhole, first of all. But the Wormhole Foundation is probably the main kind of contributing entity to Wormhole. We then have Wormhole Labs. X Lab, and then there's other kind of developer shops, zero knowledge developer shops that contribute to the kind of broader wormhole stack. And the way I would think about this is, is the wormhole foundation does everything from marketing, community, BD, research, security, and the list goes on. But we are like a, a minimal contributor when it comes to actually the building the the code or the core protocol code, if you will. Mm-hmm. A lot of that will come from Wormhole Labs. A lot of that will come to X from X Labs. And that's by design. You kind of separate these things out, different parts of the world, et cetera. That's, that's how I would think about it today. And a lot of people would, would kind of view a lot of foundations, right? Think about the Ethereum Foundation is very similar to Wormhole Foundation. We're stewards of the protocol. So our job is to make sure Wormhole continues to grow in a secure and a decentralized way. When did you start the foundation then? Like when did that sort of come into play can you take us a little, maybe a little bit through the timelines of when you went from working on Wormhole, the open source protocol, to shifting over to founding the foundation? Yeah. So Wormhole as a protocol, it's which which I think is really cool, is about, I think, three years old at this point, which is old, pretty old. You guys are pretty OG in crypto. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that's yeah. pretty OG yeah. at this point. We actually were the first the first Solana hackathon ever. It was sponsored by Solana Foundation and Warhol. No way. But uh, yeah, so I, you know, three years ago, the inception of the idea happened. It was this group of like three awesome engineers who are still involved in somewhat, somewhat in the project today. And the foundation itself was started by about, I would say, I don't know, like a year and a half ago ish. And we have slowly, slowly started to spin everything out of Jump. So now everything is completely decentralized. Jump, Jump is obviously still an investor. It contributes in that capacity today. But yeah, about three years old. Foundation's probably about a year and a half old. And we're onboarding new contributors all the time. We just onboarded a few CK teams, which is really exciting. And I can get into why later in the episode. But yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, we just had uh, Brandon Farmer, one of the uh, co-founders of Polygon. He came from one of the ZK teams that they purchased. We just had him on the show. So we dove deep into ZK and what they're doing over at Polygon to advance ZK tech across the whole Ethereum ecosystem. So yeah, we can touch on that later for sure. Okay. I want to come back to this big mission of interoperability. So as you said, you know, we started out in this blockchain uh, evolution. We only had a few chains in the beginning. And now I think we all, I, I hope for the most part, I don't have to convince anybody that we're going to be in a multi-chain world. That's for good. I think you know, there might be still some maxis out there that don't believe that, but give your head a shake. We're in a multi-chain world. You guys have already integrated over 30 blockchains, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, into Wormhole. Why do you think interoperability is so important? And you could, whether we talk like in this current market and maybe this bull run of what we expect to happen in the next sort of 12 to 18 months, or you could look even further out if you want into a longer term vision of where the role that Wormhole will play and why interoperability is so important if we're going to achieve this vision of billions of people on chain. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you say that because I remember starting out in the like interoperability space or like focusing on that niche. And it was definitely not the overall consensus that, you know, things were going to be multi-chain. It's been great, obviously, for us, but it's also been kind of funny to watch things as they progress. But yeah, I think I agree with you, right? Like the one chart that's really been up into the right the past 10 years almost is, is more chains, right? <laughs> that's the one thing we can we can kind of count on. So yeah, I think there's a number of ways we can kind of like approach approach this question in particular, but Wormhole, I think it's helpful to just take a step back and like really understand what Wormhole is because sometimes I think yeah. people associate it with things that it might not be. So yeah. at its core, Wormhole is actually just like a message. You'll hear this term message passing layer. The actual term is it's an interoperability protocol or platform for multi-chain applications and bridges. So the underlying thing that Wormhole is doing is it's a protocol in between chains that allows them to share what happened on either chain, or as other people would say, share state, right? So if you can have securely in a decentralized way, share what happened on Ethereum Solana, that like core functionality is actually really difficult to build of oversimplifying. If you can do something like that and then expand it to 30 chains, you can then the next layer above it is you could build apps. Now, what do I mean by apps? A lot of people will associate Wormhole specifically with what the app layer is, which is bridging, you could say. That's only, that's actually only one category of app. But bridging is what a lot of people latched onto because you know bridging has product market fit. And this kind of gets into to your question of like, why is interoperability important now or in the future? You know, the proof is in the pudding, right? You look at the most popular app on, on Wormhole, it's probably Portal Bridge. It's one of the oldest as well. It has like a $2.2 billion TBL oh, just on port bridge alone. That's like more than most, a lot of blockchains, right? So, so you, could, you could say, hey, let's look at the metrics, but you can also just think through the actual way in which a user does things on chain, right? If you want to do, if you have a lot of your assets on Ethereum and want to do anything on Solana, you need you need a bridge, right? And that that's the case for any of the chains we're most connected to. It's, you know, you have assets on Sui, Aptos, et cetera. And when these chains actually launch for the first time, having a interoperability protocol and these these apps built on top of it are super critical. Think about Sui, for instance, or Aptos. Most of the liquidity and users are on Ethereum, right? Still today. So if you want to like tap into this like on-chain, this group of like on-chain users essentially and on-chain liquidity, 
you have to figure out a way to connect to, or I almost view them as like these economies. So it's really, really critical, not only for like app builders to make sure they build their apps cross chain, but also for these new, especially these new like alt L1s, if you will. And actually alt, or I'm sorry, L2s, it's even important, right? Like ETH is only native to mainnet. If you want, you want ETH on Arbitrum, you want ETH on Optimism, you want ETH on your favorite L2, has to be bridge. So that's how I think about product market fit a little bit and wider operability. And what I will say is that I just talked a lot about asset use cases. Asset use, I, I say that because that's still like 70 to 80% of when we think about things on chain, why interoperability is important, right? We can shuttle assets anywhere we want, essentially, mm-hmm. and we can do it permissionlessly. But there's a whole kind of like, other, I guess you could say like cross-chain applications you can now build. For instance, PIP is a really popular Oracle. I think it has like the second most secure price feeds behind Chainlink. You know, they are completely powered by work world. Oracle's messaging infrastructure allows them to to essentially send data across all these different chains, all these DeFi apps. I think like 200 plus. So I'm being a little bit long-winded here, but I think the way I think about it is like today, why interoperability is like, well, freedom of asset flow on chain anywhere, right? In a permissionless and secure way. Tomorrow, I think it's, we're going to start to see these like multi-chain applications that will solve a lot of these UX problems that users are, you know, we keep talking about like solving UX and all these next billion users. I do think actually interoperability is going to play a big role in that. Yeah, for, I, com- I completely agree. Especially when you consider the original ethos of crypto was to be able to peer to peer remove the middlemen allow permissionless movement of money or data or identity whatever you know whatever bucket you want to pick that was where this all came from and when you think about it and it's sort of funny because well, I think we all tend to do this when you have like uh and new technologies you get a bit rose colored glasses and you know and everything's picture perfect and then you get into it and you're like oh wow actually this is really hard for an average user to use and you actually end up creating a ton of friction and and so we're in that phase that's natural that's part of any development i mean you can use the simple example remember how hard it was to get on the internet when the internet first came out right like it was not easy like you had to you know, dial up and all of a sudden you pick up your phone and your sister's on the internet. And you're like, get off the phone, like you're breaking, you know, all that stuff. So we're still moving towards that. I, I think that you bring up a great example of, and we we use the same example too, of blockchains are basically nation states or economies where if you, you might want to buy land in that economy by creating a store or acting in some sort of commerce with that economy. Well, you need to use the currency of that economy. The same if you wanted to do something in the US, you got to use the US dollar, right? Well, you need the currency of that blockchain. And if you don't have that, you need to bridge over to that. And bridging is naturally like, I think everybody thinks about wormhole as bridging. The interesting thing to me is, can you explain why the why is the word messaging the word? I just have a little bit of a bone to pick. This is a good point. Because it's only, mess- it is to me sounds like WhatsApp and like sending, <laughs> you know, a message, right? Wh- which yeah. is, there's others that are solving that for on-chain, like XMTP and push protocol, but that's not where, you know, so wh- why do you use the word messaging? <laughs> it's a great call. It, it, honestly, in crypto, we're so funny with words. I, like, I think it's one of the funniest things. Like everyone's competing on acronyms and like new terms that like, you know, shift your brain and like certain mental model, but no, I look at the end of the day, what Wormhole's doing is it, it is a form of instruction, right? It's saying that this happened on this chain and in, in, in almost like sending what happened. So in, in some sense, in some ways, the mental model is a mess. You're sending almost a message. That's kind of the mental model. So it's like, you know, the classic Alice and Bomb, like Alice locked X amount into this vault on this DeFi application and then you're sending, you know, sending that to Solana, essentially saying that this did happen on Ethereum. So I think a lot of people, I think what kind of the original thought process around that was just like the mental model does do kind of well as a message, right? It is, it is a set of instructions, but uh, you could call it honestly sending data, sending bytes. I think yeah. you know, but if we're gonna, we're gonna maybe simplify a little bit more. It's, it's the canonical phrase or word, if you will. Right? Yeah. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about you have a unique perspective on the on-chain world because you sort of play this middleman role, right? I would assume you're not a maxi for any one chain. You want all chains to succeed. You want more people to just be operating on chain. So from your perspective, where do you see the gross growth for cross-chain usage coming in the future? What are the, and maybe this is ties into some projects that are in research right now that you're in touch with and you're supporting through Wormhole Foundation. You might want to speak to that, or maybe this is just a general you know, thesis you have on where you see you know, Wormhole playing that role long-term. Absolutely. I think it's a great question. And I'll try to actually stray away a little bit from asset use cases, but I'll get into that a little bit as well. I hate to kind of lean into more of like a Web2 comparison, but really what we are doing, and you said something earlier, is like people are patient with the UX here. But when I think about it, what a lot of crypto is doing is like replacing the rails that you know everything runs on while also competing with the UX of, of Web2, while also having these principles of decentralization, you know, middlemen, et cetera. And so it's yeah. going to be a process to get there. But when we think about UX and Web2, right, like you go to a, cert, a certain page, let's say we're on Amazon and you, you're checking out for an item. There's so many things that are happening in the background, basic, right? There's you're being served certain payment information, et cetera. And so for Wormhole, and when we think about things on chain, I think applications are going to get a lot easier to use because Wormhole can send instructions in the background, right? So the way I think about this is, and I'll try to simplify it in layers because we like to think in layers or stacks in, in the Web3 space. You have these message passing, like we talked about, or data kind of passing protocols, right? And think about them as just like in between all these chains. So we're almost kind of this web in between these chains. Then on top of that, you have, let's say, your asset bridge, things like that. Then on top of that, you have your aggregators. There's like your Li-Fi of the world, your socket. They're just aggregating everything below them. And then you have the wallet, right? The wallet is where more and more stuff I think will happen for the user or the app, et cetera. But why I say that is because we view ourselves as kind of laying the railroad track, being able to like call, send a message, call things over on this chain. And, and the idea is that as you move up this, as you lay more of the railroad track, as more gets aggregated, that like user experience becomes a lot a lot nicer, right? So I think you'll be able from a wallet to say, uh, I'm on Ethereum, but you want to deposit something on Solana. That is technically actually very difficult to do in a decentralized way, but you'll be able to do that with a series of, you know, uh, cross-chain contract calls, right? That's just one way to think about the stack. The other kind of cross-chain use cases I think are really interesting are governance. I think like as, as apps feel the need to kind of be involved with more chains, they're going to have to port their governance over. So we've actually been working with Uniswap for almost a year now for every one of the Uniswap governance deployments. They they essentially need a way for from Ethereum where their main hub is to send instructions to make sure they get executed on these other chains, right? Like change the bit fee to this, and then it sends a message to these other deployments to do the same thing, right? I think Pith is another good example, like Oracle's. Think about, if you think about it from a business perspective, Pith had 90% of the TVL on Solana, like from an or from your Oracle business, 90%, but they were on no other chains. Mm-hmm. And so what they could do is they could write smart contracts across all these languages. They could audit across all these different chains, or they could partner with someone who already does that. And they're now on like 50 plus chains, right? In, in a matter of, I don't know, like probably a year and a half or something. So as, so, as long as these things become and stay multi-chain, if you want to like get the most access to users, the most access to liquidity, the builders know that they have to do that. And you could build all these contracts, you could audit all these contracts, you could the opportunity cost of all that time or just doing other things, or you could you could plug in with a provider like Wormhole and we just will get you there, right? And so to, to summarize, I think like asset use cases will continue to be the bulk of it and grow. Like we're gonna get better at that, right? Like intense, I think are interesting. You know, there's cross-chain swaps, there's cross-chain borrow lens, but I think like Oracle's governance, I could even get into games, for instance, like I think it's people are more and more going to want to have access to all liquidity and users on chain, but not having the confusion 
that comes with switching and, and trying to work across all these chains. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's a really good point because, you know, and this is the power of open source and composability. And I hate to like, can, I can't help it. I feel like I always throw these classic crypto buzzwords around, you know, decentralization, interoperability, composability. And it's hard. To and look, I, I get it. Like they're overused. But if you take a step back and you really think about if we didn't have tools like Wormhole that were open source and enabled somebody like Pith to come in and quickly within, it's hard to grasp how long it would have taken them to access the 50 chains that they can now access without Wormhole. Like you're talking about, we might not make it. Like literally we might die because we could never, or it would just take, you know, decades for us to actually build the systems necessary to achieve a lot of the objectives that we have, right? So it, it points out the power of developing and building along with partners, using open source tech and what that allows. Just because I, I brought up the word composability, I had this in my notes to make a joke about on today. And I got to make a joke about this because you recently on your Twitter pulled what I would consider a, a composable PFP move. You put a hat on yourself, on your Twitter PFP. And I was yeah. just filmed earlier. People are going to be listening to this next week. So a few days ago, I filmed a podcast about meme coin. And we were talking about dog with hat being one of the oh, most yeah. powerful examples of composability in the space because you have a meme that's composable. You can take the hat, you can take the whiff, or you could take the dog. Tell us yeah. just for a sec about... Why did you put a hat on your PFP? <laughs> to be honest, I love that. Like, I love the wormhole community because they're just so fun and creative. That was just made by the community, and I was like, oh, really? I have to put this on. Yeah, they. So someone on Twitter was like, "Hey, new like digital wormhole merch just dropped." Like some account in our again in the wormhole community, and I was just like, "All right, this is too good." Because look, if meme coins right now, you know, people may you know quote unquote dog on them not to be punny but like they do get people interested like i think there are i think it's fun right like yes they can be dangerous like anything else but dog with hat has kind of like taken on a life of its own it's made people excited and made people interested again and i think it's been a kind of a funny like theme of this cycle so like yeah to your point it's a very composable meme and the one thing that i'm starting to see is like that is like continuing from that meme, which is funny because that's actually an extension of like Doge and dog memes before it. But the thing now that's continuing is hats. Like I, I'm not only seeing it in the Warhol community, there's other chains. Like you said, we're, we're in between a lot of chains. So I get kind of like a, a little taste of all what's happening on each of these echo chambers. And there's multiple chains where like different hat type memes are, are taking off. I know Monad is an up and coming chain and they have like this whole blue hat theme and so yeah, I just had to put that on. I mean, it's the theme of the cycle. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So everything's better as long as you have a hat on is really the message of this podcast today. <laughs> okay, let's go to, I want to touch on a few things that Wormhole is solving that I think people really care about is let's talk about the wrapped asset model for a second mm -hmm. because wrapped assets and, and you know, it's funny because you said yourself, and I even in prepping for this was like, let's not talk too much about assets, but it, you can't help but come back to that use case because that is the most the money evolution that crypto is enabling is currently the best use case that is going, that is taking off around the world. And so you can't help but talk more about that. Like, let's just be real. Like, yeah, NFTs are amazing and they're going to do a lot to change digital ownership. We're not there yet. Identity going to happen on chain. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, many other use cases, but assets, here we are. So talk to us a little bit about the wrapped asset model and how Wormhole plays its role in that space. Absolutely. And I hate to like step back with a lot of these questions, but again, the way, best way to think about interoperability, like the best mental model, think about it like layer one, layer two, in a way. Layer one though is, is like the base protocol that helps you send the data helps you send instructions from one chain to another. That's kind of like the base. You could call it the messaging layer, the transport layer, the communication. You know, you you pick your flavor of word. On top of that is, is the asset layer. And so when we think about the asset layer, there's a, a few ways you can go from chain A to chain B 
whatever you want to send to assets. One of those ways is to lock and mint the asset. Another way is to burn and mint. And then you could take those two things and you can get even more creative with it. And we can, we can get into that. The lock and mint is kind of the most like historic method, if you will. The idea behind lock and mint is this. Some token contracts are what we call immutable, meaning like, you know, they can't be changed. A good example of that is ETH on Ethereum, right? If you want to burn and mint ETH, like you, you would need to upgrade it. It's for better or for worse, not possible. What you need to do instead, if you want ETH to exist on Solana, is you need to lock it in a contract on Ethereum, and then you can remint another version of it, derivative of it, a wrapped version of it or asset on Solana. And so this served a really big purpose in the past, and it still solves a purpose today. The you know portal is now much more than a wrapped asset uh, bridge. That team has been doing a lot, but it is still a component of it, right? Because wrapped assets for from like a user's perspective are just a means to an end in the sense like they'll either get you ETH on Solana or they'll help compose some sort of other transaction. Now what we're seeing though, which I think is interesting, is like a lot of people moving to burn and rent where you can, right? If I launch a, a protocol like, I actually don't know, Ave, I don't know if their token contract's immutable or not, but like you could technically burn Ave and then remint it on, on another chain. And I think a lot of people are moving towards burn and mint when they can, because this idea of a lot, what a lot of people know as like honey pots and things like that, it's a contract where you lock funds in and it's a lot of funds, right? So hackers are like, ooh, how do I get at these funds? And so a lot of people have moved to burn and mint. I think the common misconception though is like burn and mint also has its you know security risks, right? You could do what's called an infinite mint. Essentially, you could have the ability to mint as much as you want. And that that is something that's happened in the past as well. But these are kind of like the core ways in which an asset will go cross chain. And then you can build really cool stuff on top of that. So intents are essentially a way in which you could like lock something on one chain without sending it and get something else. Like I could lock Ethereum and then I could be, someone could come along and steal that transaction. Usually that's someone being a market maker and it could be Solana on, on Solana, right? And it and it's fast, it's really cheap. Uh, and that's kind of like this optimization that we're going towards. But there's been this like asset transfer history that's been kind of interesting to watch. But I think they're all to some extent still necessary, but we'll likely move to this world where it's very intense based and burn and mint based. Very interesting. Okay. I want to move to uh, your token. So you're launching your token. I don't know exactly what the data is. I know it hasn't happened yet, but I know that you have said, I got the numbers here that I believe the airdrop is going to about 400,000 wallets and there's about 600 million. W is the uh, the name of the token uh, or the ticker. You can correct me if I've got those wrong. Let's just talk about, I don't want to speculate on token price or anything like that. I'm not getting into the investment side of it today. Although uh, I hope people who listen to this show are excited about wormhole and they can make their own decisions and their own research on that side. What's the purpose though of launching the token? How does it play a role in the decentralization process? It's a good question. The contributors to wormhole for context, there's probably, I don't know, close to a hundred now we view. And, and I think a lot of like our builders and in blockchains as well, view wormhole as like a public utility. It's almost like a public good. And the more, in my opinion, the more something is a public good, the more, it should be in the hands of the public. I say that most most protocols or all, all protocols, excuse me, will eventually kind of decentralize and put the hands in token holders. But I do put emphasis on it because I think it's even more important or, or maybe not more, but it's just extremely, extremely critical. So the, the first thing is we're going to put the network obviously in the hands of token holders. So governance is kind of our main, main focus here and the reason kind of why now. And Wormhole itself, we've been building for three years and we feel like we, you know, we've gotten to a point where it's kind of this really big, ambitious project, has a lot of traction and it's a good time to kind of put it in the hands of token holders. But beyond that, I mean, it's a really interesting design space because we've seen tokenomics from apps, right? You know, Uniswap might be a good example around fee sharing or things like that. We've seen tokenomic models from from chains, right? gas, paying validators, secure the network, proof of stake, all that. What we haven't seen is like 
really strong tokenomics, in my opinion, on kind of like interoperability protocols. So there's a lot that can be done. And I think what we're excited about is like actually being on the cutting edge there. We have a few ideas that I won't get too too into uh, just yet, or else the the team the team wouldn't be too happy. But we've got a really a bunch of really interesting ideas where you know that how the token can kind of play a role in this you know protocol economy, if you will, to ultimately make Wormhole sustainable, right? Like we do. This sounds a little like maybe over the top, ambitious, or, or or not genuine, but I'm as genuine as I can be when I say this. Like we think in decades, you know, it'll be decentralized. We can't shut it down if we want to. So how does this like big, big protocol with arms in every ecosystem Mm -hmm. kind of function on into the future with us? Let's just talk a little bit about this foundation model and the importance of public good. I, I like that term, the public good tech that you're building, because you could have decided to go a different direction. The original contributors, especially coming from Jump, you know, having its roots in more of the traditional world, you could have gone in the direction of this is a private company and, you know, we're not going to make this more of a open source public good. You said yourself at the beginning, like a lot of interoperability protocols are not open source currently. Mm-hmm. So what made you go in that direction? And you being the contributors, the broader yeah, yeah. team. It's a good question. I think there's two things. I think number one is like our team ethos when building this. Like this is this is some this is like almost how it had to be designed and how we how we thought it had to be. Eventually, candidly, like eventually we shouldn't kind of have the goal of almost putting ourselves out of work, right? Like this they, this system becomes mm-hmm. autonomous enough that, you know, the foundation will will be around and of course in some capacity, but what that capacity is, it will likely change. And the goal is to really have the DAO manage it. But, you know, I think something as big as this can exist in this space without having like the core principles of the space, right? Without being decentralized, meaning specifically not to use the term, I can't shut it down. Jump couldn't shut it down back in the day. No, no one or two contributors can shut it down. Like that, that's something that like something this big could pass, pass that. It needs to be permissionless, meaning anyone could use it. Sure, you could go on an exchange, go through KYC, create an account, et cetera, et cetera, and like buy tokens on Solana or buy tokens on ETH. But like, that's not what people want. We see that in the numbers. Like builders want to build cross-chain. Users want to send assets cross-chain whenever they want, permissionless way, no KYC, et cetera. So like those are very important principles, especially for the apps building on top of us. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, look, it's kind of just, getting back to the core principles of why we got in the space and Wormel being at the center of all of that, it had to embody those principles as closely to adhere to them as closely as, we, as possible. It's a noble uh, mission that you are undertaking. And it's uh, it's so interesting to hear a, a founder like yourself say that you want to basically make yourself redundant. Like that is fascinating. That is not the typical founder's mindset. That is a ethos that you know, as you said, you felt like you needed to connect to the ethos of crypto and blockchain. And that is an ethos that really exists within the space is that we're not trying to put pad the pockets of a few people who create this stuff the way Web2 really did, where we created these walled gardens and only a few people got really wealthy and started to own all the data. We're actually trying to do the opposite of that, which is, uh, yeah, very impressive. I want to touch on um, Wormhole Base Accelerator, which I... I I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure if it's launched yet or if it is launching soon, but I think it's an important part of your ecosystem and what can allow other builders to participate and to get some funding possibly from Wormhole. And I guess that might actually also connect to your grants program. So maybe I'll tee up on, you can talk about both those things, take it how you want. Yeah, absolutely. I actually think it's really cool because a lot of us are used to thinking about like apps or dApps. It's funny how we don't call them dApps as much. I don't like dApps. You like dApps? Yeah, I don't like dApps. It's, it's, I think it's kind of gone. I don't really hear. I think it's dead. I think it's on chain yeah. now. On chain apps. Yeah. Like, on-chain it's on-chain what it is now. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Well, I'm no longer saying dApps. There we go. Um, <laughs> the way I think about the space is that like apps originally would deploy on one chain. They do well on one chain, right? 
ideally they do well. And then they say, Oh, I want to go to this, this other chain. Like, how can I do that? And there's a number of ways, but like it's an afterthought. And then it becomes this bulky process of having to do all these other deployments. And it takes a while, for instance, like where we see Uniswap go through that's taken a long time, do a lot of governance, all these additional audits, et cetera. The interoperability layer, like this in-between kind of layer, has now gotten to a point of maturity, especially from a security and a DevX perspective, when I say like developer experience, that we're seeing this like new wave of multi, what I call like multi-chain native applications. And so what, what that means is like the day one they launch, they're live across, let's say like five or six chains. So I think good examples, and I encourage the audience to go look this up, is like Pike Finance, Curvance, Citadel Finance, and this is obviously more so in the, the DeFi space for the examples I just gave, but like they're able to use Wormhole as a way to like build across all chains simultaneously. And the old models, like I mentioned, like Pith.org on Solana, they're like, okay, how am I now going to go to all these chains? Which could still work, but it's cool to see these cha- these apps go live and they're multi-chain date, date one. And so with the accelerator, with the grants program, why we're putting these in place is we want to see more multi-chain native applications. If you can build across all chains, you can get this unified experience to the user where you know there's not as much clunkiness. Like I want to go here, I connect to this wallet, I switch to this network, how to meet this asset. I also need this gas of this network, right? Like, oh, I've never been there. I need to get SUI. Where do I get SUI? I go to the centralized exchange, so on and so forth. I think it's just, it, I'm really excited to see these teams that come out of the accelerator of the grant program that are building kind of these, these, I would say more UX forward applications. Mm -hmm. And so the accelerator has already kicked off. Um, We've got six teams in the accelerator. They should be coming out, I believe in end of April. Um, But the the grants program is ongoing. Um, So it's specifically there to fund new multi-chain research and what we say, new multi-chain primitives and features. But essentially like a lot of the things we've built today and the more monolithic are on one chain building those kind of core primitives or three ones, but in a multi-chain capacity. Like think about ENS, but your ENS for all chains, you could do that on Wormhole. Who's building? That's really what we're looking for coming through the, the grant program. That's evergreen. And let me know if you're interested. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put links in the show notes to the grants program and we'll keep an eye on uh, the project coming out of the accelerator and be sure to share those. Uh, okay, before we wrap, I want to take a step back and give you an opportunity to just talk about the the longer term roadmap. And it was very interesting to hear you say, you might be one of the, I think most people in the space think in decades, but you, you probably one of the only people that's ever come on the show that actually said that out loud, which is very, very admirable because in a space where a month can feel like a year, <laughs> it's not easy to think what would happen 10 years from now. What does the roadmap look like for Wormhole and what's on the roadmap? And you pick the time frame. Tell us what is one year, five years, 10 years, whatever you want. Absolutely. I want to touch on what you just said. When we're like, we're hiring, bringing new people on the team. I think one of the things that we've, I guess one of our values now is we really appreciate the ability for people in the crypto space to be able to identify a long-term goal and be able to execute on a longer term horizon. Yes, the space moves fast and you want to pivot. I like don't get me wrong, that is 100 percent the case. But I think that there is so much shiny objects in your space. It's really, really easy, more than any industry I've ever been in. It's really easy to get distracted. And it's really difficult to prioritize. And so one of the things that we really, really value, like I said, is you know, can you kind of make some sort of thesis on where things are going. Maybe you probably make it broad. Like I said, because the space changes a lot. And then, you know, execute on that on a long-term time horizon. I think it's just like very under, something that's not present in the industry. And I think protocols that can do this well, ultimately perform well and are, are here, to, here to stay. And I think that plays into kind of our, our longer term thinking as well. But I would be a fool if I said that we know everything that's going to happen and we're extremely confident in our in our strong term like plans. But look, I think for for Wormhole, there's three things we're going to focus on. Simple as that. We're going to make things more secure, decentralized. Because if we're doing a good job, which is crazy, you should know you're using Wormhole. Like I want most of the listeners to go on applications that they don't know they're using Wormhole, and that's by design. It's just like you don't know you're using you know, SMTP or TCP IP when you're using the internet, right? Like 
you just get the UIs and you interact with those. But that's like even more of a responsibility to us. So security is extremely important. So I've mentioned zero knowledge and we'll probably have to do another episode about this, but we don't use zero knowledge for privacy. We use it for security. And we replace kind of humans or entities coming to consensus with map. And I, I just say that briefly to talk about that's going to be a much longer term investment, something that's coming out this year and will continue to come out with more in the following. But it's just this concept of making it more secure. The token, obviously, is that decentralization concept. So those are like multi-year project in and of themselves. Then we want to make the developer experience great, right? We've talked a lot about builders. I hope there's some builders listening that want to build cross-chain. That's what we need. We need more apps. Just like you think of Ethereum, you think of all these apps on Ethereum, that's how it needs to be and how it will be and how it is on Wordful. And then, yeah, the last thing I would say is we're going to continue to be everywhere. So the chain expansion journey is never done. There's always new chains as we talked about at the beginning. And so our goal is to continue to expand to these to new high value chains, chains that will be here for the long run and making sure that if you're going to use Wormhole, you know, you can have access to, to these networks. I love it. Just as we start at the beginning of the episode, it is an ambitious, ambitious target. But if anyone can do it, it feels like Wormhole is on track. You guys have already achieved so much in relatively a short period of time. Three years probably feels like an eternity for you having been so deep in this, but Yeah, it's a pretty short period of time and amazing to see the results. Before we go to a speed round, we're asking some fun questions. I just want to give you a chance uh, to tell people where they can follow you on Twitter or whatever platform you're most active on, or if you want them to follow Wormhole or Wormhole Foundation, feel free to, uh, to let us know. Yeah, I think both of those are great. I would say you should follow the protocol main account, Wormhole Crypto, at Wormhole Crypto. And yeah, you can follow myself on Twitter as well. That's probably where I'm most active. It's just my full name, Robin's Turkey. Easy, easy enough. Awesome. We'll put both those links in the show notes. Okay. We always like to do a little bit of personal fun questions at the end here. These do not have, your answers do not have to be crypto related, but they might be. One thing you bought recently for under $100 that brings you joy. This is a really good question. This is going to sound so, I recently bought just... A really good backpack. I think that can't be under understated. Like I bought a really good backpack. I think it was like seventy five bucks. And yeah, this sounds so lame, but I really like it. I it just <laughs> when you have a backpack that's that doesn't have too many of the tassels, fits my laptop well, and I now like take it everywhere. So yeah, sorry that's not more of a fun answer, but it's an honest one. No, no, it's a it's an honest answer. But to be honest, you reminded me that it, my wife's birthday is in, in next week. And she asked for, we have a eight month old son and she asked for a backpack for her birthday. And I totally forgot until this moment. So thank you for reminding me to put that on the list to get that backpack for. Well, you don't need to listen to my podcast, so she's not going to hear this. <laughs> Last question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? If it were easy, everyone would do it. Mm. Where does that come from? Cool. Is that a, a life I think, I think anything in life that you people want is typically, you know, usually it's typically kind of out of reach or, or it takes some work. And if it were easy to achieve, no one would want it because it's easy to achieve. And if it were easy to achieve, everyone would do it. I kind of think about it like a trade, right? Like if you're going to, there's a, a secret trade that you're making good money off of. By the time everyone feels out, figures it out, they're going to trade that trade. Right. But I think just in life, the simple cliches are oftentimes true and good things take hard work. And if it just kind of a reminder that when things get hard, if it were easy, you know, everyone would do it. And you likely want things that not everyone can achieve. Right. You want to be successful. For sure. For sure. It's uh, simple words, but very deep meaning. Robinson, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate you and uh, the entire wormhole team everybody at wormhole foundation and all your partners for everything you guys are building for the space it really makes a big difference i hope all of our listeners if you're not already using wormhole or maybe you are and as robin said you just don't know that you're using it which is them achieving their objectives so thanks for joining us today yeah thanks for having me looking forward to next time 
For sure. Thanks for listening and everybody have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.